Thank you, everybody, for coming. You can be seated. And before we get started, if you can all put your phones to silent, that would be great. OK, good morning, everyone. I'm Rachel Perron, uh, an instructor in the Nautical Science Department, and I'll be your master of ceremonies today. Welcome, family, friends, faculty, staff, and graduates, most importantly, to the second commencement program for Northeast Maritime Institute College of Maritime Science. Please rise for the playing of the United States National Anthem. Again, please be seated. I'm delighted and privileged to be here for the second commencement of the Northeast Maritime Institute College of Maritime Science and the graduating class of 2017. Today, we, cel we celebrate the accomplishments and academic achievements of our eight graduating students. Cameron Barrick, Zodic Burstein, Alexander Dixon, Mason Evich, Matthew Frucci, Jordan Groover, Matthew Rocha, and Bradley Springer. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct privilege to introduce to you our esteemed president, Eric DeWicke, for the welcome address. Good morning. We saw many of you at our breakfast this morning and really it was a nice moment to say thank you to our students because you really truly have taught us how to become a college, the second cohort. As many of you know, Northeast Maritime Institute, the College of Maritime Science is the first private maritime college in the history of the United States. We were told we couldn't, we were told we shouldn't, we were told we can't. Well, here we are. Uh, 
I like to think of the Institute as a way for students to actually have a second chance. Many of our students went off to other colleges. Many of them chose not to go to a traditional four-year college. And many of them simply wanted to go to work right away, but they took a chance on us at the Institute to give them the ability to go into the workforce prepared in a way that nobody else has prepared them. It gets them into the workforce quickly, efficiently, and a little bit more cost-effectively than the traditional four-year degree. It really amazes me beyond belief that our students actually are employable right away. Many of them have had job offers just after one year of college. How many of you were offered jobs this year? Wow. That's what it's all about. That's what education is all about. Education without employment, frankly, is thievery. And what we have to do is we have to maybe change the model and make it okay for our students who don't want to go on to that traditional four-year degree to create an opportunity for them to go into the workforce and do something that they actually are passionate about. To go to sea, one must be passionate because it's a passion-driven industry. People will often say going to sea is 90% sheer boredom and 10% sheer excitement. That wasn't the case for me. I loved being on the water. I love being on the water to this day. Being on the water was never boring, even when it was boring. The, the, the finer moments of taking a look over around the horizon and looking at what you might see, a whale breaching, a rainbow, an osprey catching a fish. It's an amazing way to get to know yourself and to know who you want to be. Cohort two, you were our blessing in disguise. You really were. Ladies and gentlemen, this cohort has taught us how to become a college. They were challenged. They were challenging. Any one of you skin your knees or your nose during this two years? And guess what? It's okay, isn't it? One of the things I tell my own children is to embrace your mistakes because it's the man or woman who makes the mistake in life that comes out ahead. If you accept them and you take that challenge and you move forward as a resultant factor. I am certainly, my mom's in the, the, the crowd, I am certainly one that uh, has made my share of mistakes. And God bless you, mom, for putting up with me. <laughs> I truly believe if I didn't make those mistakes, I wouldn't be here today. I've got a little bit of a ways to go, I think, just because I'm only 22. <laughs> but the reality is, it's the mistakes that teach us the most. You can be a straight-A student, skate right through the curriculum, but man, we want you to skin your knees. We want you to make those social mistakes. We want you to have a hard time. It's those moments in life that when you pause, when you pause and you have a little sense of humility, and when you're humbled, and you realize that you need to make some changes, you need to adjust your sales, that you're going to grow immensely. So if I can teach you one last thing, it's to embrace your mistakes. You're going to make a ton of them for the rest of your life. And it's OK. For you guys that made a mistake, you realize today that it was just OK. And you press on, and you move forward, and you keep those legs turning, OK? 
when you overcome challenges, all of a sudden you start to realize one certain thing in that one certain thing that we've tried to do with you all and that we're going to do with the future students is teach you how to become leaders. You've heard that Northeast Maritime Institute rates number one on the United States Coast Guard audit scheme of providing the best curriculum development and best curriculum delivery out of any maritime school in the nation. <laughs> we are the little school that does big things. So for a small college, I call it a micro college. Some of you have had microbreweries, right? Gone visited microbreweries. Pretty good beer. I don't drink, but I'm told. Good beer, better than most. Good school, better than most. You guys have something to be proud of. When you wear those blue blazers, you know that you've been challenged and you have overcome challenges, and you can be proud to wear those blue blazers in those yellow ties. I talked a little bit about employment. The fact is, and some of you have already heard this, we talk about the three tenets of success. And the three tenets of success are honesty. Some of you at breakfast have heard this. The students have heard this a thousand times. This is the thousandth and oneth time. Honesty. We are, are taught to be honest from the sense of the cash register honesty protocol. We learn that in kindergarten, or if not, preschool. Don't steal, don't take. Don't do, take something that's not yours. That's easy. The true honesty that we need to realize is who we are as individuals and who we want to be. Never hide from yourself, never lie to yourself, and never lie to others. Look yourself in the mirror each day and give yourself a wink and say, I love you. Sounds corny. I recommend this to everybody. Take a few seconds and look in the mirror and know that you're comfortable with that person in the mirror. The second tenet of success is integrity, and that is simple. Say what you do and do what you say. Don't engage in false promises. If you promise somebody that you're going to do something, you better damn well deliver. Don't balk. Don't cheat. Don't play with words. You know what was said. You stick with it. That's the NMI way. Hard work, the third tenet of success, and I believe the most important tenet of success. We talked about this at the breakfast. If you can outwork anybody else, you're going to be more successful. A against all odds. Who would have thunk that Fairhaven, Massachusetts would be a college town hosting the nation's, the nation's finest maritime school? Who would have thought about that? Who would have thought this guy that got kicked out of college and had to go work cleaning toilets on ships would be sitting or standing in front of you today and saying how proud he is of you after an amazing career. Ordinary seaman, able seaman, bosun, third mate, ship manager, Northeast Maritime Institute. We, the institute runs the 33rd largest maritime administration in the world. That's amazing. We're responsible for over 300 vessels trading around the world. We have 28 offices around the world. Who would have thought this could happen against all odds? We can do anything with honesty, integrity, and hard work. Today is a strange period in our history. It's just strange, it's bizarre. 
And part of the reality is, when we look at those three tenets of success, we have forgotten a certain sense of social responsibility. We like to point the finger at each other saying, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. We don't do faults at NMI. We embrace our mistakes. We take our mistakes almost like candy. It's our opportunity to learn. When you point the finger at somebody else, you have three pointing right back at you. And for this cohort, you've learned that. When you're blaming somebody else and you're faulting somebody else and you really step back and you look, you realize the fault rests within ourselves. It's up to us as individuals to resolve our issues and our problems. It's called personal accountability. And I'll tell you something, I'm looking at each one of you Accountable, 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 and accountable. You've got a long way to go in life. You're going to have a lot of lessons learned to, to learn, excuse me. The key is remembering that it's okay for those moments to learn those lessons but take it 100% on yourself to transition those mistakes and move them forward. The thing I love most about this industry is its diversity. When you went to the New Bedford Whaling Museum, you saw that every mariner came from a different culture, a different creed, a different race, and they worked together, they lived together, they ate together, they survived together, they were out catching whales, the monsters of the sea. It was the first integrated industry in the United States, managed and facilitated by our Quaker brothers in New Bedford and Fairhaven and Nantucket. Diversity, embrace each other for who you are, not what you look like, what not where you come from, not who your parents are, to hell with all that. Embrace your brothers because your brothers of the sea are all one. You're all brothers. Never lose track of one another. As Captain Sullivan said this morning, you will always have a couch to stay on. You will always have a home to stay in if you find yourself homeless. In between jobs, you come see us. We're your family. I'm proud. I'm more proud today than I was in that first graduation, even though I was proud. Today feels real. The sun is shining. We don't have 24 inches of snow on the ground. But look at you. Look at you. Think about it. Think of where you've been and where you are today. Do me this one favor. Promise yourselves that you will embrace your mistakes and move forward and use them as your best learning tools ever. Honesty, integrity, and hard work. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Eric. Thank you. Uh, Heather Correa, Chief Operating Officer of Northeast Maritime Institute, will now present the Stole of Gratitude. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a privilege for me to be able to impart the story of Stoles of Gratitude which NMI has adopted as a way for our students to thank those who have been instrumental in their success during this period of learning at Northeast Maritime Institute's College of Maritime Science. The legend of the Stole of Gratitude. In pre-medieval Europe, a monk traveling the countryside on a missionary pilgrimage found a starving young boy wandering through his burned out village in a daze, orphaned after the village had been destroyed by a band of marauders. The only thing he carried was a piece of fabric from his mother's clothes that had torn off in his hand as she was taken away by one of the invaders on horseback. Delivering him to the monastery, the monks set about teaching him to read and write. He schooled the boy in literature, history, and scientific thought. 
and trained him in the skills of debate and negotiation. The boy learned much and grew eager to know more of the world. When he left the monastery, he traveled to the royal city and became squire to a knight who trained him in horsemanship, swordsmanship, and the subtleties of court society. After several years, and no longer a boy, the young man's talents were brought to the notice of the king, who made him an advisor to the royal court. Contemplating his life's journey one day, he felt that he must acknowledge the support of his mentors. He took some of the fabric from his mother's dress, which he had always carried with him, some of the wool from his monastic robes, and some of the silk tunic he now wore. With this, he fashioned two cloth stoles, embroidered with the runic symbol of his village, the crest of the knight he had served, and the emblem of the royal court. He then presented these stoles to the monk and the knight, along with letters proclaiming his gratitude. Eventually, he became a widely respected ambassador, but he never forgot the kindness and generosity which had enabled him to achieve his success. It became a tradition that spread throughout the country and beyond. The stole became a symbol of achievement for students and all faculties, with varying colors and emblems symbolizing different levels of study and institutions. Today, the stole of gratitude is worn by a graduating student during the commencement ceremony as a symbol of their academic achievement and presented with honor to those who have provided aid and support in reaching their goal. After the ceremony, the new graduate presents the stole to someone who has provided extraordinary help or support, for example, parents, relatives, or mentors who have helped with wisdom, words of support, or even financial assistance. At this time, I would like to ask the graduates to join me on the stage to receive their stole of gratitude. Thank you, Heather. Angela DeWicke, the Chief Academic Officer of Northeast Maritime Institute, will now present the Lemley List Awards. Good morning. I'm honored to present the Captain Norman W. Lemley List Awards today. Students who demonstrate superior academic performance are named to the Captain Norman W. Lemley List at the end of each semester. Students are eligible for this award in any semester during which they successfully complete 15 or more semester hours of credit, which is not difficult in our program, is it? With grades no lower than C, and who hold a cumulative grade point average of 3.0 or above, and have also completed their community service hours. This award is named after Norman Lemley, who served the U.S. Coast Guard in two capacities over 36 years. He completed officer candidate school in 1962 and served at both Coast Guard headquarters and at the Pentagon during his Coast Guard career. He retired as captain in 1998, and as a Coast Guard civilian employee, he rose to the senior executive service, the civilian equivalent of a flag officer. During his 25 years in senior leadership positions, Norman was a driving force in both the development and implementation of nearly every major marine safety, security, and pollution prevention initiative. He served on government delegations to the UN's International Maritime Organization over a period of 53 years. He also participated in the diplomatic conferences in London that developed the International Maritime Security Treaty. In retirement, he didn't slow down. He continued his tireless efforts to honor the mariner, consulting on maritime safety and security, piracy, environmental protection, and national and international regulations. Norman served as the Director of Maritime Safety and Security at Northeast Maritime Institute for 15 years. 
He was also co-founder of the Commonwealth of Dominica International Maritime Ship Registry, which is housed at 32 Washington Street, and assisted with its growth and development for over 13 years. Throughout his life, Norman Lemley put the, his service first to the nation and to the international community. He left a tremendous legacy and will long be remembered for his exceptional service. Today, we are honored to present two of our graduates with not only Lemlinist honors for the spring 2017 semester, but also recognize their achievements by obtaining this honor for all four academic semesters of the program, which is not an easy feat with 83 credit hours. We are pleased today to present these awards to Cameron Barrick, and Bradley Springer. <laughs> if the two of you could please come up. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Good job, Cameron and Bradley. Uh, I would like to introduce the Director of Nautical Science Department, Captain Tom Sullivan, who will present the Senior Chief Kehoe Award. Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the Director of Nautical Science here at uh, Northeast Maritime. I've been since the beginning of school crafting these programs into what they are uh, today. I already told you at breakfast for cohort two that this is a school based on what I wish I knew then. Setting you up for success, what I wish I knew then. It's tough to do. Cohort two, uh, don't worry, you don't need your notebooks this morning, none of this is testable material. You can put those down. <laughs> Through the last uh, few semesters, along with you, uh, the words of my mentors through my career echo in my head daily. It just so happens that really what I want to impart to all of our students was explained simply to me by a sailing ship captain that was much more eloquent than I am. So I have it in front of me written down. He said in front of a group of, us, of his sailors that it's unfortunate that nautical science holds an insignificant place in traditional education institutions and really in the minds of people at large. It's defined as esoteric that even the slightest consideration of nautical science allows anyone to realize that it offers a practical way to understand basic topics like math and physics. Studying navigation and the controlling forces on a sailing ship seem to bring a hands-on meaning to the principles of Archimedes and Copernicus, Newton, Kepler, Bernoulli, the list goes on and on. This some consider so boring in traditional education institutions. Maybe nautical science provides a unique connection to our saltwater roots, and really our maritime past. But if you go beyond academics, there's subtle comparisons between life and nautical science. For most of us, birth is a departure from a safe harbor, the beginning of a long journey from a known position. We proceed cautiously at first. We develop skills slowly. We learn the ropes. We gain experiences necessary to make choices with regard to our course and our speed we head towards our chosen destination. As time passes, we quickly see that life takes on the characteristics of a sailing ship on a broad reach, gently rolling along with the trade winds. And we all know more often than not that it seems like a hard upwind close reach with every wave knocking us back farther off our chosen course. Occasionally, we're overtaken by squalls, some small and some so violent that we find our sails blown out and ourselves wallowing in the trough of mountainous seas. With each passage of every squall, we become more alert and more cautious in our life. Even with such obstacles, we're able to proceed and use one of several means to fix our position. Lines of position, like relationships, like family, 
like our education, like our career. So often our journey is influenced by a change in the wind, and we must always be ready to change that course. Change tax, heave to or set full sail, or even to anchor and wait it out. If only more people were as fortunate as us to have had an experience from the perspective of the high seas on the deck of a ship. Maybe then we could all develop a certain humble respect for our place in the world and deal with life's issues in a modest and straightforward way, the same way which we deal with the safe and successful navigation of a ship on the constantly changing world of the sea. One of my favorite authors, Joseph Conrad, wrote of our trade, the trade that we've entered into together, that the redeeming aspect of this breadwinning is the attainment and preservation of the highest possible skill. It's made up of accumulated tradition kept alive by individual pride, rendered exact by professional opinion, and like the higher arts, spurred on and sustained by discriminating praise. That's why the attainment of proficiency, the pushing of your skill, with attention to the most delicate shades of excellence, is a matter of vital concern. He continued in a different short story, I'll leave that to your minds, that most sailors lead, if one can express it, a sedentary life. Their minds are of the stay-at-home order, and their home is always with them, the ship, and so is their country the sea. One ship is very much like another, and the sea is always the same. The immunability of the surroundings, the foreign shores, the foreign faces, the changing immensity of life glide past, veiled not by a sense of mystery, but by a slight disdainful ignorance. For there's nothing mysterious to a sailor, unless it's the sea itself, which is the mistress of their existence, and as, as inscrutable as destiny itself. Through the last two years, I've watched Cohort 2 grow from self-concerned individuals ready to plow headlong into life's navigational hazards to self-aware merchant mariners, ready to help any sailor in need. These sailors are ready to make the sea their home, and that really makes me feel like we're doing something right. I've been known in challenging times to remind our faculty and staff, and even the president, of how a landscape can be changed by a glacier. But that change is barely noticeable day to day. Take a step back, cohort two. Look how far you've come. The glacier of cohort two has changed our landscape immeasurably. Day to day, small steps. I can only hope that you're as excited for your next voyage as I am. And the NMI is a much better place for all the effort that you've put into our program. Thank you both for allowing me to be a part of your voyage plan and for being a part of your life. I hope our courses cross again in the future. Today is a tough day for me personally. We're not all here together today. Not in person, anyway. We've lost one of our own this past semester. And all of us, like I mentioned before, are trying to fix our position since we said goodbye to Senior Chief Kehoe. Jules was a huge part of our lives together. Most people don't know that Jules and I shared career paths in the Coast Guard. We attended Quartermaster A School the very same summer. We both became bosun mates as the Coast Guard evolved. Jules continued on in her Coast Guard career as I tacked off to a career in the Merchant Marine. But one thing that we shared in common was attaining the rank of Chief Petty Officer. In 2005, when I was initiated as a Chief, I was taught through some hum humility the meaning of the rank insignia for the Chief, something that Jules and I both wear daily. A fouled anchor with the shield of the United States superimposed on its shank is the symbol of the Chief Petty Officer. 
To the novice, these are just meant to identify a chief in rank only, but to a chief, the chain, the shield, the anchor all have a deeper meaning. The anchor is emblematic of a chief, its stability, its security. It reminds the chief of their responsibility that they have to keep those that they serve safe from harm and to maintain the traditions. The historical significance of that shield dates back to the revenue cutter service. Congress wanted cutters to be distinguished from other vessels afloat by a unique ensign. On that en ensign created in 1799, in other sense, the shield is a distinctive part of the design. 13 stars, 13 stripes, representing the 13 original colonies, where we all came from. The chain attached to the anchor is symbolic of flexibility and strength. It serves to remind the chief that the chain of life is forged by day to day, link by link. It's forged with character and virtue in the fires of adversity that will be faced every day in the course of a career. It also stands for the reliance on one chief to another to get the job done, and that every chief shall endeavor not to be the weak link in that chain. And lastly, that chain is fouled around the anchor, known as the sailor's disgrace, to remind every chief that there may be times when there are circumstances beyond their control in the performance of duty, yet you still have to complete the task. It's during these times that humility and fortitude are brought to bear. Cohort 2 and everyone here at NMI knows in our hearts, uh, Jules embodied the meaning of that rank of senior chief that she wore so proudly. She, by example, showed every single one of us how to carry ourselves with dignity and pride. I'd like to take this time to start a new tradition at MI, and that's by recognizing one of our graduating cohort for following in Jules's example of being a shipmate, of taking care of others, of holding others to a high standard. So I'd like to award our very first Senior Chief Kehoe Award. At Integrity Hall, in the entrance to the instructor's office, is a wooden plaque with the Senior Chief rank insignia carved upon it. There's blank slates for every graduating cohort to have one student hold this position. It's a tough choice for the Institute to choose one student that represents all that. But if we step back and take a look at who Jules was and the Mariners that you've become, it became uh, fairly clear. Cam, would you join me on stage? The award reads, this honor is awarded to a student mariner that reflects NMI's core values of honesty, integrity, and hard work, and has demonstrated sustained exceptional standards of proficiency and conduct, and whose professional appearance and bearing are consistently impeccable. This award shall be in recognition of a student mariner that demonstrates through action that they are following the example and tradition of Senior Chief Bosomate Jules Kehoe, U.S. Coast Guard retired. Thank you, Cam. Thank you. This tradition, you're a part of it.
thank you all for uh, joining us today, and, and it really does feel like a family. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Sullivan. I'm honored to introduce the next speaker, the Honorable Gwendolyn Sykes, Chief Financial Officer of the United States Secret Service. Ms. Sykes is the United States Secret Service Chief Financial Officer. In this role, she is responsible for the execution, development, and stewardship of the Secret Service's resources and currently manages a financial team that includes budget, financial management, relocation, and financial system experts. Ms. Sykes began working with the Secret Service in May of 2012, bringing her wealth of financial management skills and talent for organizational transformation and uh, enhancement. Among her many accomplishments, Ms. Sykes is the first African-American female to serve as the Chief Financial Officer at NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Nominated by the President of the United States and confirmed by the United States Senate, she was responsible for the financial management and health of this $16 billion agency. Ms. Sykes led more than 500 finance professionals located across 10 geographically dispersed locations throughout the United States in the development and execution of financial policies, processes, and procedures. She has also served as Excuse me. She's also served as Yale University's Chief Financial Officer, the first at that university in its 306-year history, and the Chief Financial Officer for Morehouse College. Previous government experience includes working with the Department of Defense and in the office of the U.S. Senator Ted Stevens. She has been recognized for her achievements by Black Enterprise, Newsweek, The Today Show, and the National Black Caucus of, of State Legislators. Ms. Sykes. You please join us. Good morning. Now, after that introduction, you're probably all wondering this is the Na Northeast Maritime Institute, and you have a CFO coming to speak to you? <laughs> Gentlemen, there's papers underneath your seats, there will be a test. <laughs> So why am I here? And why did they invite me to be your keynote speaker? That was the first question I had. But knowing your president, I already pretty much knew. So what I'm going to do is take an opportunity to share with you my journey and how I got to be who I am today and what I do today and hopes that it means something to you today as you embark on your new journey. Three words that you have heard throughout the whole cohort and throughout this whole day, honesty, integrity, and hard work. Those are the things that I can honestly tell you have given me the opportunity to be who I am today and to have the experiences and the great jobs that I have had throughout my career. So just let me give you an idea of who and what I was before I became all those things that you spoke of. <laughs> Some of you gentlemen have visited my home. I come from the great state of Anchorage, Alaska. Okay, so some of you have been floating on my waters. <laughs> and by the way, have any of you guys seen Russia? <laughs> so I was a little precocious young lady. I see a nice lady in the back there, precocious. I was a tomboy. It's great. I had two brothers, one before and one behind. I couldn't help myself. So there wasn't anything I personally couldn't do, okay? No was not an option. No was just a means to find another way to get around things. So as a precocious little kid in Alaska, it was kind of nice because I had the free and open range, kind of like you have the free and open seas. And of course, we did a lot of fishing. I still owe your president a fishing trip to Alaska. He can get there on his own. He got his own boat. <laughs> but most importantly, I learned the value of three key things, honesty, integrity, and hard work. So it was interesting when I was doing an interview for Newsweek, they asked me, well, how did you, what is it in you that makes you a success? And I kind of thought about it and I said, was there any experience? Was there something that happened to you that kind of drove you to these successful jobs? And I said, 
yep, it probably was. I kind of got in a little bit of trouble in junior high school. Not that any of you gentlemen have gotten in any trouble, correct? <laughs> Lady? No? Okay. And I slightly pissed my mom off. Okay? So she sent me to Nome, Alaska, and for those of you who have been up to Alaska, you know exactly where that is. There was one grocery store, one place, the landing strip, and a military satellite, and that's pretty much about it. She sent me there for the whole summer. So my leadership began in Nome, Alaska <clears throat> on that summer. There was a rascal bunch of kids there that lived there from the military base, and I would get them together, and we'd go and play on the shakers. And for those of you who don't know what those are, the little shaking machines that you search for uh, gold rush, during the gold rush time frames, so we would shake and see if we can get the rocks and find the gold. Well, they were in kind of disrepair, so we'd play on those and we'd play on the beach. While playing on the beach, of course, I have no fear, and I'm with quite a few gentlemen, or young men at the time, and we would go out on the beach, and we would roll walruses, you know, just literally push them over and wah. <laughs> and I got all of my little motley crew of folks to follow along and roll walruses with me. So the nice guy from Newsweek goes, that's kind of like cow tipping. And I looked at him like, okay, whatever. <laughs> but the whole concept that first of all, if the walrus had a roll back on us, we'd had a problem. <laughs> If the walruses chased us on the beach, we'd have even more of a problem. But we saw no fear, because we were young folks that didn't know any better. And sometimes, throughout your career, you have to go back to that moment in your life when you didn't know better, and that you can actually push folks forward. And that's what I've done throughout my career. I started out graduating from Anchorage, Alaska as an East Anchorage High School student. And most folks in my high school said, we either go to school here in this area, you become a waitress, you might go to the academic school there at East Anchorage High School, and you might get a degree, and you might do something in business. But instead, I wanted to go and check out this place that was across the country where the president lived. You know why I wanted to go there? Because when I got my first paycheck working for my father, I calculated how much I was supposed to get per hour. When I got that check, it was a lot less than what I calculated. And I was slightly pissed. That's my interest in money, okay? And that's when my dad informed me about this guy by the name of Uncle Sam. I wanted to meet Uncle Sam, <laughs> and I wanted to know why he thought he was entitled to my money. Mm -hmm. So now I take a journey to Washington, D.C., and I become, I go to um, Catholic University of America. We were a Catholic family, so I went to Catholic U. I'm still on the search for Uncle Sam, because he's still taking my money. <laughs> and I recognize that he is part of this thing called the United States government, okay? And the United States government is what we use the Uncle Sam money for in order to take care of ourselves and our institutions. So I began my journey in working in government. I worked for Senator Ted Stevens, uh, the late great Senator Stevens from Alaska. And then I went on to work for the Department of Defense. But what I learned while I was working in the Department of Defense, there's many people that work in that Department of Defense. You got four different um, military institutions plus the Coast Guard. But there's lots of folks. But what could distinguish me from a young girl from Anchorage, Alaska, getting a degree in accounting, that would propel me to the heights and the great jobs that I've had in my career? One of those things was being honest. Honest at all times. When you're playing with other people's money, you better be honest. That's one of the things that you definitely know. But you always have to have integrity. Don't think when it comes to spending other people's money, people haven't said, well, can, you pass, can we do this? Or, well, can't we do that? When you're dealing with other people's money, integrity is going to be key. Because at the end of the day, not only is it going to be my signature on that document, it's going to be the fact that I'm going to have to address that issue at some point in time later down the road. 
As I became the NASA CFO, it was very interesting times because believe it or not, the world had lost interest in space exploration. We didn't really care about going to space. And it was just one of those opportunities that I said, hey, let me be part of the team that says, why are we doing space exploration? Because again, you're spending $16.7 billion to go into space. And I've got real problems here at home. I've got folks dying of cancer. I got folks that we need to feed. Why are we taking our money to send it into space? What I learned is space exploration, NASA a, as an organization, is really taking that opportunity to propel us forward, to move us forward in so many ways. A lot of the technologies that you will encounter as mariners on the boats is NASA technology, things that they have developed and expounded on throughout the years that have helped you navigate, communicate, and actually be able to sail the high seas, as well as kind of keep up with the hurricanes. So I think my cell phone is probably going off in the back there also, because we're dealing with the hurricanes right now. But as we continue on in my lovely journey, how did I end up being the CFO of Secret Service? Well, I'm going to tell you a little story about the nice guy sitting next to me. I took a, a period of time out from my personal career in one of those stormy seas time frames to take a break from government service. I had a mother with breast cancer and I had a father with Alzheimer's. Taking that break out, I went into academia and went to Yale University and to Morehouse College. And my final year at Morehouse College, my father took a quite a turn when it came to his Alzheimer's. And I remember, soon after my father passed, your president made a call and he said, kid, I'm younger than him. How you doing? I said, I'm doing good. He goes, did you need to come down? He said, nope, I'm good. I got it. My father's getting ready to pass, but we'll be fine. But something I learned in that moment about your president and something that has carried me through my career is the people that you meet along the way in your journey, you never know when you can pick up that phone in your darkest, most intriguing hour and know that you've got somebody there for you. You have just gone through an experience called a cohort. That experience called a cohort has gotten you to a point where all eight of you are someone that you can depend on. I unfortunately had the experience of trying to teach your president in a cohort environment, and we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but knowing that, knowing that you guys have all gone through the opportunity of honesty, integrity, and hard work in this cohort experience, I want to make sure that each and every one of you know that you are now connected to a collective that will propel you in your journey propel you to new, greater successes that you've never seen before. Take this opportunity and the opportunity of all the folks in this room to include myself, to include us in your journey as you move forward, as you excel, and as you take on new challenges. And recognizing that, I've had the opportunity of talking to some of your folks, uh, some of your professors, and I parked on Center Street. Who has the best parking spot on Center Street? He's smiling but not at recognizing or acknowledging. Knowing that, that there's another nice gentleman here who is consistently the first person or volunteering for all projects in the room. And then there's someone in the class that has to dispute that the earth might not be round. <laughs> I worked at NASA. <laughs> I'm here to tell you. <laughs> and then I want to talk definitely to the gentleman who has the opportunity, who has somehow, he's going to be here in five minutes. Did he make it to the graduation? Yeah. He did make Next it. Day. Okay. He texts that he's five minutes out, but he comes in 15 minutes later. <laughs> okay. You're on time, you're here? 
It's Larry, okay, good. All right? So there's just a little bit about each and every one of you that makes you special and unique. But what I challenge you when you're out there in the workforce and in the field and trying to make it your way, that you take that opportunity to not only make yourself unique, but also make yourself the go-to person. Not just trying to be the best or the brightest or the one that's seen, but be the go-to person. The go-to person when things are good and the go-to person when things are not working so well. Be the kind of individual that your president and your board expect of each and every one of you as a cohort graduate. Be the kind of person that I know of your president today. Because even in all of my successes, there was no way that I could step up to be the CFO at Secret Service if I didn't have that phone call on that day that said to me, you know what? Pick your, put your big girl panties on, stand up, it's okay your dad's gone, and make your next part of your new journey. And for that, I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be your graduate speaker. And if everyone will come up, I also brought you um, pins that I would like to incorporate each of you into my family called the Secret Service. I have 6,800 men and women strong. And what I've found, even just coming here to Fair Haven, that in conversations, I have met individuals that says, hey, you know, I know a Secret Service agent from Georgia. I know a Secret Service agent from, and we're all over the world. <laughs> so when you're wearing these pins, do not be surprised of the people that will approach you and be there for you and watch over you. So I'd like to welcome each and every one of the cohort number two into my family called the Secret Service. the biggest blessing. I just got a coin from one of the students. I didn't get it from you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are gathered today to celebrate the achievements, hard work, and dedication of our graduates. We will now begin the most important part of the graduation ceremony, the conferring of the degrees. Cameron J. Barrett. Cum, cum laude. Zodic R. Burstein.
<laughs> Alexander R. Dixon. <laughs> Mason C. Evich. <laughs> Matthew F. Frucci. Matthew J. Rocha. and Bradley H. Springer. <laughs> also, cum laude. But wait, there's more. Each graduating class, we honor someone who is integral in the process of building this college with an honorary degree. Last year's recipient, Ms. Heather Correa, literally helped us dog through the application process 
and got us through a very tough time. Our next recipient truly deserves this degree, for he was the one we reached out to first to head up the program, to become the director of this program. Like me, his career has been a little bit unprecedented, a little rough going. I was told Tom Sullivan needs to be your guy. He reminds me of you. <laughs> I said, oh, that's great. I can't manage me. Tom and I butted heads the first two years like you wouldn't believe. As you can hear Tom speak, when he speaks, he teaches. He teaches us all. He's passionate. He's articulate. You can pay attention to Tom. But Tom has heart. He has gut-level instincts that are impeccable. He has grit. One thing we want to make sure of in our students is they have grit. Tom has grit. He's dealt with grit. He's dealt with things that give him the grit, that makes him the guy, the anchor of the program. When I couldn't handle Tom, I was told, Jules Keough will straighten out Tom. Fact. <laughs> Jules was our gift from heaven. Mr. and Mrs. Keough. Jude, thanks for sharing. Jules with us because, man, she straightened us out. She straightened Tom out. <laughs> Still is. Still is. I couldn't be more proud to give Tom this honorary degree because, man, he's really made this program come alive and vibrant, and he's delivered. Tom, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, who you are as a dad, not only to your own children, but these children right here. We're all children, guys. We'll always be children. Thank you for all that you've done, and I'm really proud to give this to you. Does this mean I'm part of cohort two now? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> the first day I walked in the door um, was not as part of this program. I came here as a continuing ed student, uh, sailing on my license, calling Cape Cod home. My time off was valuable to me. It was really important to spend time at home when I wasn't working. I did a internet search looking for a radar renewal that I needed to go back to work. Um, there were a lot of options. There's a lot of schools that offer radar renewal. Just so happened that one of the uh, board members' names popped up associated with the school. There happened to be a captain that I really enjoyed sailing with in the Coast Guard. Said if that person is associated with the school, that's a no-brainer for me. So I walked in the door, was greeted by uh, a coffee table, a coffee table with smiling faces. And uh, that path has never stopped. Every morning, every morning, I don't know how this school does it. The energy that comes out every morning is amazing and welcoming and is a part of what makes the school a family. I already said it, Merchant Mariners are a family. It takes a long time to understand that. That feeling that I got coming in for a half-day class was something that took years to build in other professions. Uh, that speaks wonders to the people you keep around you. It speaks wonders to the example that you set as a family. 
When the call came about the college program starting, it came from two different directions. Eric called and mentioned what he wanted to do, and I treated it as wild as it sounded at the time. I've got a stable job, I enjoy it. Sounds great, have fun. <laughs> about a half hour later, I got a call from a surprise call, uh, a name that I hadn't heard in a few years, which was uh, the former Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Vince Patton, who said, you just got a phone call? You want that job. <laughs> aye, aye, Master Chief. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, and uh, that, that started the, the path down the road. The one thing that I will never forget is walking in the door the very first time to the school, though, for that radar class that I took, being welcomed in. And that's something that I hope that we continue to do as the school grows. There's a lot more faces sitting in the audience than there even were in our last graduation. There's a lot more students. There's a lot more parts to this. But the one thing that doesn't change is the fact that it's a family. And a big family does a better job of taking care of each other than a small family. Everyone in this room is part of the family. We look out for each other. It's what we do. I'm proud to be a part of this. I'm a proud father to, as is Eric said, I'm a proud father to the cohorts as they come through. But it's more than that. It's knowing that you're going to take this places that we can only dream of. You guys are going to take this really far. So. Take what you got here, hold it close, but never stop. Never stop. You can go as far as you want to go. I'm living proof of that. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom. At this time, I would like to ask all of the graduates to stand, including Captain Sullivan. Ladies and gentlemen, and I say ladies and gentlemen, the graduating class of Northeast Maritime Institute's College of Maritime Science of 2017. Please be seated. You know, when we look around this room and look at the architecture, I always think about growing up in this town and knowing that a little wharf rat from Union Street, Henry Huddleston Rogers, just a poor kid succeeded beyond belief in the top richest people in the world, in the history of the world, Henry Huddleston Rogers rates 22nd. Bill Gates is 35th. Bill Gates is the richest man in the world. Well, they say Alexander Putin is, but that's all hidden. <laughs> so Henry Huddleston Rogers truly far out wealthed Bill Gates. And what he did is he gave us kids from Fairhaven hope. It gave us the ability to understand that we could achieve from coming from nothing or coming from something. You are Fairhaven kids now by decree. You are amazing. You've learned lots. You've taught lots. We learned more from you, gentlemen, than you learned from us. 
Please remember the three tenets of success, honesty, integrity, and hard work. But let's add to that. Let's remember to be kind and compassionate to everybody that comes along your path. That's what sets us apart at Northeast Maritime Institute than any other maritime educational institute. We truly care about the people that go to school here. Our community, the maritime community, is embraced. And the reason is they taught us how to be kind and compassionate and loving, as corny as that may sound. Please remember to be kind and compassionate, but go out there with a smile in that little twinkle in your eye, knowing that you guys are NMI graduates. Lead and lead strong. Lead with a smile, lead with kindness, lead with humility. Be the go-to person. And remember, our creed is to always honor the mariner. Congratulations to the 2017 graduating class.